This week's episode of the Cheech and Current Wrestling Podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash Cheech and Current. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. That's www.audibletrial.com slash Cheech and Current. Welcome everybody to the Chief <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Cheech and Kern's WCW Flashback City. I'm your host, yeah. Cheech, alongside my main man, Kern. What up, Kern? What's up, Cheech? What's going on? Nothing much, man. We're back here, bigger, better than ever on WCW Flashback City, and today is our third episode of the Teaching Currents WCW Flashback City, and we're going to talk about WCW Fall Brawl 1995 the War Games. Now, of course, you guys know that we started this series with the very first edition of WCW Monday Nitro that took place in the Mall of America. After that, our second show was the Monday Nitro after that, and after that Monday Nitro, in chronological order is the WCW Fall Brawl 1995 pay-per-view, which we're going to talk about today. And then after that, we're going to go back to Monday Night Show the night after this event. So, yep, but today we got WCW Fall Brawl 1995, and it was the War Games. Kern, you got anything, any special memories from this event, watching it back in the day, 90, 1995? Well, I didn't watch it live at the time, but yeah, I do got uh, I like the War Games. War Games was one of my favorite matches of all times. When it first came out in 87 or 88 with Jim Crockett, I thought it was one of the best ideas. You get to see, you know four or five against four or five of the top superstars at the time going at it. I thought it was a great concept, and I love the War Games. Yep, I like the War Games also. Now, I know you guys must be wondering, you guys have been watching, been listening to the Cheech and Kern WCW Flashback City. Normally what we do is we go back and we watch Monday Nitro, and we watch it as we do the podcast. So basically what we do, we got the show running in the background, and we're watching and we're reacting to what we're seeing on the TV. But since this is a three-hour pay-per-view, we're not going to do that because we're not planning to stay here three hours talking to you guys um, <laughs> about the pay-per-view. We're not going to comment on that. So what we're going to do is we're going to do kind of like what we do on our normal uh, Cheech and Current Wrestling podcast. We're going to go over the show with our notes, and then we'll just talk about it as we go along. All right? And then, but for next week's show, when we go back to WCW Monday Nitro, we're going to go back to that same format where we'll watch it and we'll kind of react as we go along. All right? So kind of just bear with us there. As we go through this uh, WCW Flashback City Fall Brawl 1995. Yep. That's right. Now, this took place on September 17th, 1995. It was in Asheville Civic Center in Asheville, North Carolina. And it had an attendance an attendance of 6,600 fans. We were talking about this earlier, Kern. WCW would book like small venues back in the day, right? Yeah, they always really packed small venues. They never got into big coliseums. Yeah, now if you guys... Until later. The later in the day yeah like um like our last podcast we were talking about was survivor series 1987 and we compared that one to starcade 1987 starcade only had 8,000 fans while survivor series had 21,300 fans so you, there's a big difference there in attendance figures between wwf at that time and the nwa and here in wcw 1995 we still basically got that same format where wcw was still booking these small venues and, and, and buildings, right? And WWF was going into these 15,000, 18,000 seat arenas. Now in 85, I'm not sure if WWF was selling out those arenas, but I'm sure there were there were still like big, big arenas, right? That right, Kern? Yeah, I don't think they were selling all of them out, but yeah, they were big arenas and they had big crowds. Because I remember watching some of those. You can even watch right now on the uh, WWE Network some of those old school wrestling at the Madison Square Garden or the old Boston Garden, where you know there's 15, 20,000 people there. That's right. So we're welcomed into this event by our commentators, Tony Schiavone and Bobby the Brain Heenan. And, of course, I realized one thing I used to love about WCW was when they started bringing the ring announcer, Michael Buffer. You know, Michael Buffer is, is always synonymous for these big events. And it, was, it, it could be boxing events. And, and back in the day, it could be wrestling events at WCW. And, of course, Gary Capetta would call, like, all the, the, the jabroni matches. <laughs> so to speak, he would call, like, the, all the undercards. And, and Michael Buffer would basically call, like, all the, the, the heavyweight cards. All the main event cards was Michael Buffer. I like that idea, too. I like Michael Buffer as a ring announcer. That's right. So we go right into action here with our first match, and it was the number one contenders match for the WCW United States Championship. And at that time, the U.S. the, the United States Champion for WCW was none other than Sting. Uh, but Sting would be part of the main event and the war game later, a little later on in this event. So the first match is between Flying Brian Pillman versus Johnny B. Bad. 
and the match starts off with both men kind of feeding each other out. Then we get a quick arm jam taken out by Johnny B. Bad. Flying Brian then does a hip toss on Johnny B. Bad. Then he gets a side headlock on takedown. Johnny then counters with whips Flying Brian to the ropes, and both men try a double drop kick. They do a little bit of chain rusting with a lot of two counts. The commentators at this point are selling the fact that these two men are friends, and they're also friends of the current WCW United States Champion Sting. The action then starts to pick up a little bit with Flying Brian performing a flying drop kick for a two count. For some reason, that's not clear. Johnny B. Bad is bleeding from his face. Flying Brian tries to get. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I don't know if you noticed that. He just. You, yeah, you, yeah, he's yeah, fighting, yeah. and then you look at it again, and he's, and he's fucking bleeding from his face. <laughs> just the way you said it, it was kind of funny <laughs> because that's actually how it is if yeah. you were watching it. Yeah, Flying yeah. Brian tries to get Johnny B. Bad to submit by placing him in on a Boston Crab. He then releases the hold and proceeds to slap Johnny B. Bad. This fires up Bad who then whips Pillman to the ropes and gets over a back takedown for a two count. The crowd are into every pin attempt. Johnny B. Bad seems to be very over with the crowd, and they start booing Flying Brian. Flying Brian was not a heel at this time, right? No, he wasn't. He was a good guy, which was funny. Flying Brian goes to the outside to get a breather as the crowd keeps booing. Pillman then tries to lure Johnny B. Bad to shake his hand, but Johnny wants no part of it. Pillman, <laughs> Pillman goes to knock Bad head into the turnbuckle, but Johnny reverses it and nails Pillman. He then performs an over-the-top rope leg drop onto Pillman for a one, two, nope. He then places Brian on a sleeper hold for a while. Bri Pillman then reverses, and both men collide in the middle of the ring. Both men are slow to get up, but Bad is the first one on his feet. But Brian is able to nail a headbutt on both men are down again. <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> Brian is able to get to his feet and starts pounding on Johnny B. Bad, Pil on Johnny B. Bad. Pillman then drops Bad to the outside, and Michael Buffer announces there are only five minutes left on the match. This was a 20-minute time limit match. Flying Brian then does a suicide plancha over the top rope to Bad, but Bad moves out of the way, and Pillman crashes hard to the mat. But then as he gets up, Johnny B. Bad performs one of his own flying, fly, one of his own onto Flying Brian, and the crowd is going nuts at this point. Bad then throws Pillman into the ring and goes for a double axe, a double axe handle from the top of the rope onto Pillman, but Pillman is able to do a drop kick onto bad as he comes down and the crowd is on their feet going nuts brian then goes for a pin for a pin for a two count bad is able to get up and performs a sit down power bomb for a one two nope brian is able to reverse a whip into the ropes and nails a tombstone pile driver on bad for a one two nope and the crowd is going absolutely nuts at this point these people current are hitting each other with everything they fucking got the crowd is going nuts. He busts out a, a tombstone power driver. Johnny B. Bryan busts out a power bomb, a sit-down power bomb, kind of like a Batista bomb. Um, then Bryan then goes for a swinging DDT off the second rope, but Bad is able to counter it for a two count. Pillman then counters Bad into a Russian leg sweep and turns it into a submission move that Tony Schiavone called. I've never seen that, but he's got it hooked on. Johnny B. Bad starts to mount a comeback <laughs> and nails flying Bryan with a punch and goes for the pin, but Pillman kicks out at two. Brian then performs a jumping clothesline from the apron to the ropes onto bed and goes for a pin count, but time expires. Since it's a number one contenders match, Nick Patrick, our favorite referee, informs Michael Buffer that the match must continue under sudden death overtime. Now, give me let, 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 explain something to me, Kern. If it's a regular match, isn't it sudden death anyways? Because the first guy that gets pinned loses? I would agree so. So why the but fuck were they calling this sudden death overtime? Hey, they got to make it sound good for TV. <laughs> so they go into sudden death overtime. The match then restarts, and both fight their way to the outside. Brian then rolls Bad back into the ring and attempts a drop kick from the top rope, but Bad counters with one of his own, and both men are down again. Brian is able to get another sleeper on Bad, but Bad is able to fight it off and gets a sleeper on Pillman. Pillman then reverses with a back suplex. Pillman then goes for a superplex from the top rope. From the top of the third rope, but Bad counters and nails Pillman with an over-the-back pin attempt for a two-count. Pillman then nails a huracarana on Bad for a one-two. <laughs> nope. They go back and forth for a little bit, and Bad performs a Frankensteiner from the top rope for a two-count. Brian then goes to the top rope, but Bad is able to throw him off into the barricades and does the bad move. The bad move is nothing over than a flip over the top rope onto his opponent. He whips Brian into the ring and tries another rope, rope maneuver, but Brian is able to counter it. Brian then throws Bad into the outside again and goes flying through the ropes onto Bad on the outside. They get back in the ring to do a double crossbody, and Johnny B. Bad is able to nail him and fall on top of Brian and pins him. 29 minutes, 14 seconds. This match was fucking badass, Kurt. 
It was the best match of the night, in my opinion. That's right. This match, people were going nuts at this point. Um, it was kind of interesting the way the dynamics started going because Flying Brian came in. He was clearly a babyface. Uh, Johnny B. Bad came in. The people were going nuts. I don't know why Johnny B. Bad was so over at this time in WCW. It's like every time I see him, he was so over. And then he would go to WWF later on, become Mark Merrill. And, and, suck. He, and it would suck. Yeah, and I was like, what the hell? I mean, Johnny B. Bad was so badass in WCW. He goes to WWF. How does it, it doesn't really get gimmick in WCW, this Johnny B. Bad gimmick. I didn't really get it. Was he gay? Was he no, not gay? No, he was a little, was a little <laughs> Richard lookalike. You remember Little, little Richard? A little, was Little Richard gay? I don't know if he was gay. I mean, he was kind of a little feminine. You know, he had a little feminine side to him. I, I'm not sure if he was gay or not, but I mean, he was a, a Little Richard uh, imposter, basically. That was, that was his gimmick, but it was he was so damn over, and... You know, a match like this really put him on the map. This is why Flying Brian, this is why I was mentioning that in one of our earlier podcasts that um, Flying Brian as a heel in WWF going with a, with a white hot stone cold would have been fucking money. You know, it's a shame we never got to see that. But it's because of matches like this because Flying Brian could definitely bring him in the ring. Well, they had they had a nice feud going on Stone Cold and Flying Brian in the WWF. Yeah, but I mean Stone Cold wasn't yet Stone Cold was on the rise at that point, and he wasn't yet you know to the point where he would get later on. And Flying Brian was there, but uh, he wasn't there yet. You know, I don't know. It's like well, those two would have would have gotten to like their peak and, and, and collided. I think would have been just magic. You know? Yeah, I agree. It would have been something special. Yep. So then after this match, we go to a backstage interview between Mean Gene and the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. And Ric Flair talks about his upcoming match with Arn Anderson. And uh, one of the things that I remember clearly about this was that he said that he loved Arn Anderson, but today Arn Anderson was going to go up against the best. And he's going to know why Ric Flair is the best. Basically, that's, uh, you know, kind of what, what he wants to say there. You know, it's funny because before this match even took place in this pay-per-view, not many, I, I didn't believe it as a fan. I knew there was some sort of swerve coming around the corner somewhere. But yep. we'll let that determine at the end of the match. Well, the second match was Cobra versus Sergeant Craig Pitbull Pittman. That's right. <laughs> Cobra, Jesus, I forgot. <laughs> well, <clears throat> this was the second match of the evening. But before the match starts, Cobra's in the ring and Pittman's music plays out to come out to another roster. Prince Ikea dressed in an army uniform in the to distract Cobra. It might not, it, right, that was Prince, I, I could swear that was fucking Prince Ikea that came down dressed as, an, as another soldier. I'm, yeah, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that was him. <laughs> this is hilarious. Uh, as this is happening, Pittman then lowers from the rafters onto the arena floor. He then proceeds to crawl from one ring into the other as Tony Schiavone screams from the top of his lungs. This is real guerrilla warfare. <laughs> Shit, you're not ladies and gentlemen. He <laughs> on Cobra, and the match begins. Sergeant Pittman attacks Cobra on the outside, but Cobra reverses and rolls him into the ring. But Pitbull regains the advantage and places him into a cold red armbar submission for the win. <laughs> One minute and 22 seconds. I think this is the longest match of the night. <laughs> <laughs> One minute, 22 seconds. I mean, this was a fucking throwaway match. I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm glad that we got 30 minutes of Brian Pillman and Johnny B. Bad, and we didn't get, you know, like that match was like 20 minutes, and this would have been like 10 because probably, it was horrible. Could, could probably this match suck for the one minute and 22 seconds because probably that match went too long, do you think? I don't know. I, I mean, it might the be, but, but I'm glad that shit happened because, I mean, I and I shit you not, fucking when... when when Craig Pitbull Pittman started like crawling under the ring like he was in a fucking war, he started crawling like under the ropes, like he was, you know, like he was in a war. And and Tony Schiavone yells as as loud as he can, "This is real guerrilla warfare! You can't, you, you got to be like, come on, man, you know, come on." <laughs> hey, he was doing his part. He was trying to sell it, but yeah, yeah. So then after that, we go to a backstage segment, and they had explained that. On a previous show of WCW Saturday Night, Mr. Wonderful had fought Macho Man Randy Savage and lost. And he was feeling kind of like, you know, he had lost who he was. He couldn't remember who he was. So they kind of give him this backstage uh, backstage segment, segment, I should say, where he's there and, he, and fucking this guy comes up from the Psychic Network hotline. Gary, uh, Gary, Gary Spolsey was his name? I can't remember. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, so he comes there and he, and he starts reminding, no, you're Mr. Wonderful, Paul on him. No, you're Mr. Wonderful, girl. You're Mr. Wonderful. And Mr. Wonderful comes like, oh, yeah, I'm Mr. Wonderful. And he starts kissing himself and everything. And this is going to be very interesting once we go into our next episode of WCW Teaching Currents, Teaching Currents WCW Fastback City, which which is the next night on, on Nitro, where Mr. Wonderful re-debuts as Mr. Wonderful. And he comes out with this fucking weird-ass opera music and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, what's it called, a mirror and all that stuff. Yeah, I remember when that came out. I was wondering, like, what the hell is this guy doing? Yeah, so they were kind of setting that part up here in this pay-per-view. Then we go to the third match, which was none other than the WCW World Television Championship match. And it was Diamond Dallas Page. He comes down with the Diamond Dow, and he's accompanied by Max Muscle. Who was this Max Muscle, Curran? I'm not sure who the hell this guy was. Max Muscle was the muscle. He was the bodyguard to uh, DDP. Yeah, but, I mean, he never really amounts it to anything, right? Because I really don't remember this guy. Nah, you're not gonna. That's probably the last person, last time we'll mention his name on this podcast. Okay, all right. So and then he goes up with the current WCW World Television Champion at the time, the Renegade, which is what, he was accompanied by the Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. The Renegade. He was a um, ultimate warrior wannabe, wannabe like ripoff thing. type of thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So then the match starts off with DDP attacking the Renegade from behind into the corner and does a Russian leg drop for a two count. Renegade intimidates DDP, and DDP just stumbles onto the floor and into the crowd. This was hilarious. Like, DDP started attacking him, right? Then the Renegade just kind of, like, no-sold it and started walking towards DDP. DDP kind of started walking back, and he just fucking fell out the ring. He stumbled onto the ropes, and he fell out the ring. I don't know if he did this shit legit or it was a shoot, but he fell outside the rope. Then he kind of walked. He, he got up, and he stumbled, and he fell into the crowd at this point. Renegade goes after him, but DDP is able to get the advantage and throws Renegade into the ring. Back inside, Renegade regains control with his power. DDP then counters and is able to take advantage and jump over the top rope to perform a, the, Zircon, the Zircon Cutter. This is basically what Bobby Heaney called the Zircon Cutter, which is he takes his opponent's head and he hits his throat over the top rope and he falls to the ground. This is you know, basically what Macho Man would do. You remember Macho Man would grab the guy's head and kind of run, jump over the top rope, land on the floor, and kind of take, choke him on the rope. That's exactly what the move was, but he was calling it the Zircon Cutter because he was a diamond. DDP then hits a spear into the corner. He then goes for another, but the Renegade moves out the way and follows up with a running clothesline. Renegade then does a cartwheel into a splash onto DDP in the corner, as Tony Schiavone calls it. What a great move! <laughs> <laughs> this was hilarious. What a great move! Moves like this make WCW the greatest wrestling organization in the world. The guy just fucking did a cartwheel on the wrestling uh, mat. But anyways, and just as he's finished saying this, DDP counters Renegade with a swinging DDT, and Schiavone and Heenan both yell, What a great move that was! Both men are slow getting to their feet, but DDP regains control and goes for the diamond cutter, but Renegade counters just as Max Muscle gets on the top of the apron. Renegade then whips DDP onto Max Muscle, who then falls to the mat as Renegade performs a power slam on DDP. He then goes to the top of the rope and dives on Max Muscle onto the floor. As Renegade gets into the ring, Max Muscle is able to hold his ankle just enough time so DDP can get the diamond cutter on Renegade and get the three count for the win, eight minutes, seven seconds. DDP is the new WCW World Television Champion. What do you think about this match, Herman? I thought it was a good match. I thought it was nice seeing DDP uh, winning a TV title at the time. You know, this was Diamond Dallas Page's, like, coming out party as a wrestler. And it was nice for them to put some goat on him. But I thought the match was uh, it was a decent match. Yeah, I think this uh, this this Renegade guy, he was there for a couple of years. Well, I, I think, I'm assuming, I, I think I remember he was, he was there, like, in 96 or something. So he was there for a while, but he really was, you know, he really didn't amount to anything. Uh, the Renegade, right? He was like too damn green, I think. Well, I, I think he was there for a little bit longer. I think he was there for like three or four years. But yeah, he didn't. He was he was more like a not even. I wouldn't even say a B player. I'd say more like a C player. That's right. Yeah, and then after that, the fourth match comes on, and the fourth match is for the WCW World Tag Team Titles. And the participants would be Harlem Heat, which is Stevie Ray and Booker T with Sister Sherry, versus Bunkhouse Buck and Dirty Dick Slater with Colonel Rob Parker. God, I like that team of Bunkhouse Buck and Dick Slater. I love Dick Slater. Dick Slater was one of my favorite wrestlers for a long time. I mean, and he wrestled everywhere, if you think about it. Yeah. You've seen the WWF, you've seen him in WCW, you've seen him in the NWA, AW, Puerto Rico, you've seen him in Japan. He's a badass. Everywhere. He's a legitimate yeah. badass. Him and, uh, what was, uh, Zeb Coulter, what was his name, uh? Dirty Dutch Mantel. Dirty Dutch Mantel, those used to be some badass. And Dick Slater used to be partners with uh, American Dream, Dusty Rose in the 70s also. 
Really? All right, wasn't, well, it, wasn't it Dick Murdoch? I think it was Dick Murdoch. Was it Dick Murdoch? Yeah, it was Dick Murdoch. <laughs> pretty sure it was Dick Murdoch. We're going to check that out. I'm pretty sure it probably could have been Dick Slater, too. Well, anyway, the match starts off with Booker T and Dick Slater. Booker T gains an early control and tags in Stevie Ray. Stevie Ray dominates Dick Slater for a bit with a headlock and an arm slam. Stevie Ray tags in Booker T again, but Dick Slater is able to back Booker into a corner for the tag to Bunkhouse Buck. Back and forth tag between Booker T and Stevie Ray as they dominate for most part within locks and, within locks and headlocks. Dick Slater gets tagged in and suffers the same fate as Bunkhouse. You know, Booker T and Stevie Ray, they were a good tag team. They always did a lot of tag team moves together as a tag team, yep. which was something like. One of my favorite tag teams, yeah. Yeah. Booker to the outside, and Booker T hits his lower back with the back of the apron. That allows Buck Cowboys to nail Booker on the outside. Dick Slade is now in full control as he goes for the pile drive on Booker T. <clears throat> Excuse me. Booker T dominates, Buck House dominates Booker T for a bit. Booker then does three goes into flying life class in the corner, but Buck House moves out of the way. Uh, you right there, Kurt? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm good. Dick Slater keeps the pressure on Booker with with in and out tags. Dick Slater plays Booker on the Boston Crab, but Stevie Ray breaks it up. Booker T then counters Buckhouse Buck for a hot tag to Stevie Ray. Stevie goes nuts on both guys, and the action goes to hell as all four men are fighting in the ring. Meanwhile, the opposite rings, Sister Sherry and Colonel Parker get in the middle of the ring and start hugging and kissing. Do you remember that crazy angle they had with each other? Yeah, that was kind of weird. They, they, all of a sudden, they just started like making out and hugging and falling in love. At some point, I remember they were explaining that Sister Sherry had fallen and hit her head, and she kind of like lost her memory or some shit like that. Yeah, she had family Marlin falling madly in love for him or something. Yeah, that was yeah. A weird, weird thing. Anyway, all this action is going on at the same time, but the reference distracted, and down comes the nasty boys to nail Dick Slater with his own boot to allow Booker T to pin Dick Slater with 16 minutes and 49 seconds of the match. Harlem Heat, your new WCW World Tag Team Champions. What did you think about that match? I think it was a, it was a good, you know, a regular uh, tag team match, you know, between these, these, four, these four guys. And I think it was just there kind of as a placeholder to kind of further the storyline between Sherry and Colonel Parker. And, of course, they, they eventually will then move out which was, uh, you know, uh, Bunkhouse and Dick Slater will kind of move out from the transition, I should say, from the championship tag title picture into a feud with the Nasty Boys and, you know, and, and allow Heart of Heat to then run with the titles for a bit. Oh, I kind of like Dick Slater and Bunkhouse Buck as the tag team champions. One of those old school hard-nosed uh, wrestlers. Yeah, but I enjoyed the match. I think it was a decent match, good match. Then after that, we go to backstage interview with Mean Gene Oakland and Double A Arn Anderson, and Arn talks about his match with Ric Flair coming up next. Yeah, and it was a very emotional promo that Arn Anderson gave. I mean, they kind of did like a little video package where they they showed how they got to this match, to the point of this match where it was kind of like uh, they were trying to sell the point that Ric Flair was kind of taking advantage of Arn Anderson, and uh, you know he would put Arn Anderson in these weird stipulations and, or these weird situations where Arn Anderson always had to had to bail him out and they were, WCW was really pushing hard this match they were trying to sell it as the match everybody wants to see but nobody thought would happen and it's kind of weird because when you think about it Arn Anderson and Ric Flair I'm not sure re people really wanted to see that you know but they were building it like that the match everybody wants to see but nobody thought would happen it made no sense at the time when they were doing it nobody believed it nobody bought it I mean like the, the, they didn't even have a really good view to begin with like it was just stupid that's right. So we go right into this match. Now, before the match gets on the way, they pan the camera to show a lot of the wrestlers in the crowd to watch these two men fight. Their billing ass is a big deal, right? So then, uh, you know, they show uh, Eddie Guerrero was there. Dust Wonder Kid was there. Uh, Flying Brian was there. Uh, Buff Bag with American Males. Um, uh, Colonel Parker came <laughs> came out again, you know? Yeah, a good, a, good, a good portion of the guys from the back were there. Yeah. So then, uh, so they start the match, they lock up, and Anderson is able to get the best of Flair early on and drops Flair with a slap across the face. Flair takes his time and goes for the, to the outside of the ring to regroup. And now, you got to remember, this was in, in North Carolina. This was Flair country. This is where the horsemen were kind of ruling their territory back in the late 80s, right? So, you know, people are really into this match. People are screaming. People are, people are on, their, on, their, on their feet, you know? 
So Flair takes his time. He goes to the outside to, to the other ring to regroup. Flair then comes back into the inside, and Anderson is able to get the best of Flair again, and Flair goes down again with another slap for Anderson. Anderson continues to dominate. <laughs> That's right. Anderson continues to dominate wrestling with his power and taking it to Flair. Flair then counters Anderson and nails him with a stiff chop that drops Anderson. Flair starts to break down Anderson, but Arn is able to counter again, nails Flair with a knee to the back for the, from the second rope. He then places Flair in an arm lock for a bit and starts breaking him down. Flair tries to make a comeback, but Anderson just keeps countering. Flair is able to lure Anderson to come at him full speed to the ropes, and Flair sidesteps him as, as Anderson comes crashing down to the mat to the floor. Flair then does a dive to Anderson off the top rope to the floor. Now, this was fucking nuts. I mean, how many times have you seen Ric Flair go to the top rope and dive from the top rope onto the floor? You know, I think that's the first and only time I've ever seen that happen. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not too often. So, so yeah, so Flair now has control of the match and dominates for a bit as he tries to break down Anderson with his chops. Anderson is able to backdrop Flair to the floor as both men are going full force at each other. Flair hits a back suplex on Anderson on the outside. Back in the ring, Flair nails Anderson with a right punch and brings him down. Flair then holds Anderson upright in the air as he performs a backdrop. They go back and forth for a bit. Anderson then whips Flair into the corner as Flair gets caught up in the top rope. Arn takes advantage and goes for the kill. He signals for the DDT, but Flair is able to hold on to the rope and Anderson crashes to the mat. Flair then places Anderson on the figure four leg lock. Crowd is going absolutely nuts at this point and Anderson starts to reverse the move. Anderson reverses and Flair breaks it up but the damage is already done and Flair goes for the figure four leg lock again but Anderson counters with a roll up for one, two, no, crowd is on their feet. Flair then nails Anderson again with the knee, in the knee I should say. The ref is tending to Anderson on the mat as Flying Brian steps onto the apron and nails Flair with a kick to the back of the head and Anderson is able to hit the DDT for the pin, 22 minutes, 37 seconds. And it got a mixed reaction from the crowd. This made no fucking sense for me, Kern. You're going to have to explain this to me. Why did Flying Brian get involved in a match between Arn Anderson, Ric Flair? And in my opinion, I thought, or I was under the assumption, that Arn Anderson was the face in this in this match and Ric Flair was the heel. And so why the fuck did Ric Flair get screwed over by Brian Pillman, who had just previously kind of seemed to turn heel at the beginning of this paper when the crowd uh, were turning out. Was he doing heel taxes before this or something? I mean, because he didn't he come was start, He was starting to, but not there yet, but he oh. was starting to. And this was when uh, Arn Anderson wanted to join the, the Four Horsemen, as we'll go into the future, we'll figure it out. This was a scheme that Arn Anderson and Ric Flair put together, which was why nobody bought it. They were supposed to feud against each other. They were supposed to bring in Brian Pillman. He was going to join the Horsemen, and that was for they could get tactics to be able to get back at Sting. Wow, well, that, was, that was very because see on the line. Yeah, that was kind of very confusing because I mean we just you know two two episodes before this one that we're recording now. Brian Pillman was in the very first match of WCW Monday Nitro with Jushin Thunder Liger, and people were going nuts for him. You know, he was a full fledged face here. And then, basically, two weeks later in the pay-per-view, he's turning heel, or, or the people are booing him. I don't know if something happened in WCW Saturday Night. We, we, we're not watching those shows. But, uh, you know, people are just booing him. And then, out of nowhere, he just comes here, clicks Ric Flair in the back, and, and, and causes him the match. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was just an angle that they were trying to do at the time. They just uh, could have done it in a different fashion, probably. Then after that, we go to a video package of Kevin Sullivan being absolutely fucking weird. This was probably one of the parts where WCW, I said, was, was still lacking back in 1995 to get a, kind of get him over that hump of WWF. Because this was like some weird Kevin Sullivan shit where they would do like these weird video packages. I don't know if you remember this whole, when, when, when Hogan was doing this whole feud with the Dungeon of Doom and he would go into the dungeon, which was nothing more than, it looked like a weird, crappy stage. Piper's pit. Huh? Piper's it pit. Like the it looked like a bad Piper's Pit. Yeah, it was just like this weird set that you could tell it was a set there. And this guy, you know, it was just such a weird uh, package. Basically, they were just uh, talking about the, the feud with uh, Kevin Sullivan and Hulk Hogan and the Dungeon of Doom. Then after that, we go to a backstage interview with Mean Gene. And he's, he's interviewing Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, Lex Luger, and Sting. And they talk about, they hype up the War Games match, which is coming up next, Kern. That's right, which is the sixth match and the main event of the evening, the War Games. And the War Games, the participants, is the Dungeon of Doom, which is Shark, Kamala, 
the Zodiac, and Ming. And they were accompanied by the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan. And their opponents were the Hulkamaniacs, which was Hulk Hogan, Sting, Macho Man, Randy Savage, and the total package, Lex Luger, who they had with them was the Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. The match starts off with the Shark and Sting. The Shark immediately gets the upper hand with his size advantage, but Sting is able to counter with his quickness. The Shark immediately moves to the other ring, but Sting files across the top rope and nails the Shark with a clothesline. The crowd goes nuts for this. Shark is then able to wear down Sting with a bear hug. Sting is able to escape and nail a couple of kicks to the gut, and Shark gets caught up in the ropes between the two rings. Both men go down as time is winding down for the first period. The next comes in the Zodiac. Sting is able to fight off the Zodiac who on the other ring until the shark makes his way and both men are double teaming Sting for the remainder of the two minute period. Next is the macho man Randy Savage to come in. He nails the shark and the Zodiac. He is going nuts but two and one advantage take over because Sting is still down. Next is Kamala. Kamala was one of, I think one of the most underrated fucking wrestlers out there, man. Kamala had a good gimmick. He had a nice look. He's just, in my opinion, so underrated. I'm surprised he's not in the WWE Hall of Fame. Like, what are they waiting for? The guy had to die before you put him in there? Like, what, what hasn't he done in wrestling? Yeah, I mean, it, it's weird that they haven't put him in the WWE Hall of Fame. You know, I, I, I was, I recently, not recently, I guess it was a couple of years ago, um, I heard him on a podcast. I'm not sure if, it, I think it was Stone Cold's podcast, actually. There he came out and he mentioned that because Kamala made his way into wrestling, I think it was through Memphis. And and Jerry the King Lana, you know, Jerry the King Lana is a real good artist, right? So he started drawing, like, on Kamala's stomach like the moon and a couple of stars and kamala was explaining on this podcast that he always thought that jerry the king lawler was making uh like a racist uh remark to to kamala he always thought it was a banana instead of a moon oh well you could tell it was a moon yeah but i mean he always thought it was a banana and i mean if you, and now that i'm thinking about it i'm like wow you know, why would he? Because he was the African, you know, what was his name? The, the Ugandan giant or something like that, right? The African the giant. Ugandan giant, right? Yeah, there you go. So he, he said he always thought it was a banana. And so Jerry the King Lauder is saying, no, man, these are stars and moons. So I, I just thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, that is funny. But like I said, Kamala considered himself to be very underrated. All right, well, next was Kamala to get into the ring. And one, the one-man advantage is helping the Dungeon of Doom control this match. Sting and Macho Man are in bad shape here as they get broken down. The next man in is Lex Luger to even out the odds. He comes in on fire with the Hulkamaniacs taking advantage for the first time in this match. Towards the end of the period, Luger hits Macho by accident. This causes Macho Man to start trading blows with Luger as the heels take advantage once again. You know that the Macho Man kind of had that as we, you know, as we left last week's episode. Macho Man was like, "I can't trust this guy." You know, this guy was part of the other guys, the other teams, and we can't trust him. He's gonna turn on us. And then inadvertently, Lex Luger hits him in this match, and Macho Man, you know, he's fucking nuts. He's he's like, "Ooh, you motherfucker!" And they started they started go, going blows at each other. It's blowing at it. Yeah, I know. Like, what the hell? Well, next is Ming, and once again, the Dungeon of Doom takes the advantage. The action goes all over the place as Hogan waits anxiously from the outside to get into this match. Hogan finally makes his way into the ring and starts throwing pop power all over the Dungeon of Doom's eyes. Bobby the Brain Heenan calls out Shivani for applauding Hogan and his cheap tactics. The Hulkamaniacs take it, take it to the heels and the action is all over the place. At one point during the match, Hogan is able to place the Zodiac in a camel clutch to submit him for the win as Tony Shivani calls it the reverse chin lock. What the fuck? <laughs> Tony Schiavone, man. Tony Schiavone at this at this fucking pay per view. He needs to get his moves down, man, because he was like crawling like some weirdest shit. Like, what a maneuver! And, and, and he yeah. calls this a fucking reverse chin lock, a camera clutch, and he calls it a reverse chin lock. Yeah, well, that's Tony Schiavone for you. And as the stipulation for this match, Hogan had five minutes in the cage with the Taskmaster. The Taskmaster tries to escape, but is forced into the cage by the rest of the Hulkamanians as Hogan beats him up. Inside the cage, all over the place until down the aisleway. Uh, what the? <laughs> until down, down the aisle comes none other than the giant. That's right, the giant. The giant makes his way into the ring and jumps over the top rope and grabs Hogan around the neck and chokes him down to the mat and breaks his neck. Until the Hulkamaniacs come for the save. The pay-per-view goes off there with Hogan laying on the mat. What do you think about the pay-per-view? 
Well, this was this. Let me let me first go back to this ending here. This ending was kind of weird because you know Hulk Hogan is beating the shit out of Kevin Sullivan. We see the giant come down the aisle. Now they were selling the giant. We didn't mention it here, but they were selling the giant throughout the pay per view because the giant during earlier in the day was in like this big monster truck. WCW had like a fucking hard on for monster trucks back at this time. I don't know why, but yeah, they had Facebook. yeah they had uh, they had the giant in a fucking monster truck, which I don't know how the fuck he got in there because those monster trucks, the cabins are like really small. But he was in a monster truck and he crushed Hulk Hogan's motorcycle that the Hulkamanians had given him or something like that. And during right. the day, they were kind of teasing that uh, the giant was going to face Hogan because I think they were building for the first match that the giant ever had, which was for the title with Hogan. And I think he would eventually beat him up. I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves because we're going we're gonna to review that show uh, coming up ahead on, on Cheech and Kern's WCW Flashback City. But... They were kind of building towards that. But in the end of this pay-per-view, he comes in. He takes away uh, referee Randy Anderson. He pushes him off the way. Or Nick, what's his name? Randy Anderson or Nick Anderson? Randy Anderson, right? Yeah, he takes Randy. away yeah, Randy Anderson. He gets into the cage. He starts jumping over the, the ropes. Tony Schiavone is like, oh, the athleticism of this giant. He gets in there. He grabs Hogan. And we're expected to believe, at least that's what I saw as I was watching this, that the giant murdered Hulk Hogan in front of everybody because he – Literally, like, moved his head like he went. You know when you're watching a movie and a guy just yeah, ripped the guy's neck? The guy's neck, right. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what the, uh, the giant did. He did a move over like if he would have just literally killed Hogan there. So I didn't, kind of didn't make a, a lot of sense in, in, in a way, but um, that's the way we go ending this pay-per-view. Well, they were trying to make the giant look like a brute monster. That's what they were pretty much trying to do there. And they were actually selling him as the son of Andre the Giant. Oh, I mean, they went as far as to say Hogan was like, oh, and I just felt Andre's presence. And as I look back, I see this big giant. I was like, oh, man, they actually fucking mentioned Andre the Giant's name. Yeah, I mean, it was a good pay-per-view, though. I mean, it's 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 the beginning of what's coming around the corner that nobody's about to see yet. Yeah, that's right. I, I must say, I must say, overall, it was an entertaining pay-per-view. And if I was to rate it out of 10, I give it a 6.5. 6.5 out of 10, I think it was a solid pay-per-view. But I think it will still, we're still in that in-between phase between WCW kind of being sucky a little bit and going into that whole, you know, Nitro era where they start really bringing their A-game into the shit, you know. So we're still kind of doing that little transition between the Dungeon of Doom, because I always remember that era of the Dungeon of Doom as WCW kind of sucky. Now, if I had to pick between WCW 95 and WWF in 95, I probably will go with WCW, because 95, WWF just kind of, I, I wasn't really into it. At that point, but uh, plus they sucked in '95. Yeah, I, and uh, so I don't know. We, we got that that little trend. We're we're in that transition phase, I should say. But it was a solid pay per view. Six point five out of ten. Karen, what about you? What do you give? I give it a seven. I think it was a solid pay per view. I think uh, the main event was okay. I liked the ending of it, having you know the giant come out and do some giant stuff. I think it was a solid pay per view. I give it a, uh, I give it a seven. I think seven's a. Uh, a good number for him. All right, a seven. So there we go. Cheech and Kearns, WCW Flashback City, Fall yeah. Brawl, 1995. This was the first pay-per-view in this series. Uh, going forward, we're going to do this. Pay-per-views, we're going to go just, you know, we're going to go on our notes. And uh, the WCW Monday Nitros, we're going to go back and we're going to be uh, doing them live as we do our podcast. It's just an easier way, a, a better format for the show. Um, but you know, this, the, the pay per view is just three hours long. We're not gonna we're not gonna be here for three hours. But uh, I think it was a solid pay per view. And uh, next week, current we got WCW Monday Nitro once again, and we got Ric Flair going up against Brian Pillman, and uh, and the aftermath of all of everything that went down in the pay per view. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be a good Nitro. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. For for you guys, uh, before we get out of here, I just want to let you guys know. That for you, the listeners of the Cheech and Current Wrestling Podcast and Cheech and Current's WCW Flashback City, Audible is offering a yep. free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You guys can download this week's choice. Yes, My Improbable Journey to the Main Event of WrestleMania by Daniel Bryan for free. Or you guys can download your choice of audiobook free by trying audible.com. Just go to www.audibletrial.com slash Cheech and Kern and complete the sign-up process for the 30-day trial. You can choose your audiobook and give their service a try. If you're not satisfied, you can cancel any time during the trial and you won't be billed. But guess what? You can keep your free audiobook as our gift to you for being a loyal listener to the Cheech and Kern Wrestling Podcast and Cheech and Kern's WCW Flashback City. 
Remember to download your free audio book today. Go to theaudibletrial.com forward slash Cheech and Current. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash Cheech and Current for your free audio book. Now, before we get out of here, Current, out of here, Current, we want to mention that you guys can send your questions, comments, and feedback at Cheech and Current at gmail.com. That's right. You guys can follow us on iTunes, or, or please hit the subscribe button on iTunes, YouTube. You can stream us on Stitcher. We're available on all those platforms. And um, a little feature that we got for all our YouTube subscribers, if you guys have not checked this out, you can go to YouTube, www.youtube.com forward slash Cheech and Current. It should pop right up. We got a special feature last week. We actually had a special guest, and we like to call it Cheech and Current Extra, as Kern was actually on location in Valparaiso, Indiana. He went and wrestled. He went and visited Smash Pals Pro man smash mouth pro wrestling and he had a little chat with our main man prime cut nick cutler one of the fastest rising independent wrestlers in the united states there i see the world as he took on wwe former wwe superstar hardcore holly you guys can check out that interview there and we got special clips of his match am i right Kern? that's right it was actually a really good interview with uh, nick cutler and uh we got clips of the match but you can see how the match turned out and to see his uh if everything he said came to fruition. That's right. That's right. Now, we're, we're going to go forward with these uh, Cheech and Current Extra. They're going to be specific for YouTube. They're not going to go on uh, on our iTunes or our Stitcher uh, streaming because it's a video. You know, the, the idea is for you guys to see the interview and see the match highlights and everything. So they're going to be specifically for YouTube. But what you guys can do is you go to, to our YouTube channel and you can subscribe. Every time one of those Cheech and Current Extra pops up, you guys will be notified and you can be able to watch it. So just go there. To www.youtube.com forward slash Cheech and Current. Um, so that's about it, Current. Other than that, you got anything else? No, nope, we're out. We're good. All right. Well, we'll catch you guys next week on WCW, on e Cheech and Current's WCW Flashback City. And remember, this Saturday night, we got our Rowdy Rowdy Piper tribute show. We're going to be talking about Royal Rumble 1992. You might be asking, but why the hell are you choosing 1992, the Royal Rumble, for a tribute show for Rowdy Piper? We chose this show because it's the show where Rowdy Piper becomes the new Intercontinental Champion. And I think this is the only time Rowdy Piper has held a singles title in the WWF. And we chose this show to give the man, the Rowdy, uh, our tribute to him. So we're looking forward to that. It's going to be a great show coming at you this Saturday night on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, anywhere iPods, uh, anywhere podcasts are found. Peace! All right, guys, take care. Nothing else. It's closing time. <laughs>